Hello, and welcome to today's show, Legacy Living, Make Your Life Count. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria, Gloria Burgess, international leadership expert and trusted advisor. Welcome to Legacy Living, Make Your Life Count. I'm so glad you joined me today. I want to give a big thank you to those of you who are listening. I also want to give a great big shout out to all of you listening around the world. I'm delighted and so grateful that you tuned in. I hope you are enjoying a fabulous day today and that you're having a fantastic week. Because you know what? In the grand song of the universe, life is so very short. It's short, sweet, and very precious. So, I hope you're making a difference in your own life because when you do, you also make a difference in somebody else's life. Now, a lot of us, a lot of folks really want their life to count for something, but they don't know how to do it or they don't know where to begin. So they ask me, Dr. Gloria, how do you do that? How do you make your life count? Well, (laughs) it's really very simple. Very simple. You make your life count day by day, step by step, moment by moment, every single day. 365, 24-7. Now, I'm going to say much more about that later on. But right now, it is time to just relax and listen in. That's right. It's time to hit the pause button. It's time for today's episode, which is all about the power of one. Now, I want you to imagine that we're in the same room. Ah, Maybe it's your kitchen or living room, and I'm sitting right across the table from you. I'm pouring you a cup of tea or coffee, and we are about to have a cup, a small cup, a dose of what matters. So again, today's focus is all about the power of one. The power of one person who can be the difference, who makes the difference in someone else's life. Now, today's episode is focused on one of my favorite people on the planet. Her name is Gwendolyn Brooks. Her life is what legacy living Make Your Life Count is all about. Now, most of us know Miss Brooks as a marvelous poet. I know her as a kind, gentle, smart, and fiercely caring human being. For me, she was one person who made a difference in my life. And you know how some people, some folks just show up at just the right time in your life? Well, that's exactly what happened for me. Ms. Brooks showed up and really made a difference at a time in my life when I needed it. Now, I know all of you want to make a positive difference in our world to make your life count to make your life matter. But sometimes you're just kind of scratching your head and you're not sure how to make that happen. You might find yourself thinking, well, you know what? I'm just one little person. What can I possibly do to make a difference in my own or somebody else's life? It's kind of hard to understand just how much impact one person can really have. Now, fortunately, I've met many people who've made a difference for me. Many people who showed up at just the right time and that person has made such a difference in that particular season of my life. Now, sometimes the season was just for a minute. It was a very short season in my life. And yet their impact rippled out far beyond the the few months or weeks or, or days or even a few hours that I was graced by that person's presence. Gwendolyn Brooks was one of those individuals who made a difference, who made a significant difference in my life. She was there at just the right time 
at just the right place in just the right season of my life. In fact, I had the good fortune to meet Miss Brooks not once but twice. And on both occasions, although they were years apart, her impact on me was positively profound. Now, I'm going to share a bit about my life-changing encounter with her and the remarkable difference she made in my life. But first, let me tell you more about this amazing artist and poet and humanitarian. Gwendolyn began writing and publishing when she was very, very young. By the time she was 11 years old, she had published four poems. That's pretty impressive. Before she turned 30, she achieved national acclaim for her poems, a collection of poems called A Street in Bronzeville. A Street in Bronzeville. In 1950, when Miss Brooks was 33 years old, she became the first African-American poet to win the Pulitzer Prize. Now, she won this prestigious prize for her book of poems called Annie Allen. Gwendolyn Elizabeth Brooks was born in Topeka, Kansas. When she was still a baby, her family moved to Chicago during the Great Migration. Miss Gwendolyn remained in Chicago for the rest of her life. Her writings reflect the rhythms and melodies and cadences of her neighbors and her neighborhood. Like so many African Americans coming of age during this time in the United States, Ms. Brooks experienced the bitter sting of bigotry and racial prejudice. Her experiences shaped her and they fortified her. In fact, her writing reflects the social forces that prevailed at that particular time in the United States. So, who is Gwendolyn Brooks? Now, I'm not talking about her accomplishments. I'm asking, who is this person? As you might imagine, when I was doing the research for this episode, I came across many publications that listed Miss Brooks' amazing achievements. But I found only a precious few that captured the essence of the person, this unique human being. And only a handful that captured the Gwendolyn Brooks that I knew. Now, I'm talking about Gwendolyn Brooks, the woman, the woman who looked like she could be one of my neighbors, the woman who was gentle yet fierce. I mean, this Gwendolyn could have been one of my aunties, the woman who had a heart for young people, a heart for school children and gang members who should have been in school, but whose lives were lived in the streets a heart for those who live their lives behind prison bars. This is the woman I knew. You see, when I heard her voice, when I heard her read her amazing poems, I realized Miss Gwendolyn's voice could have been my voice. I mean, she echoed my love, my love for the sweet, sweet music of language my love for the colorful, imaginative music of words. She echoed my love for people, my love for justice, not for just a few, but justice for all. My love for standing up for those we love, standing with those who have no one else to stand with them. My love for telling stories of people who may not be able to tell their own story. I met Gwendolyn for the very first time in a classroom. That's right, a classroom. I met her in my high school classroom in Ann Arbor, Michigan, in Mr. Kerrigan's AP English class, right? <laughs> I 
remember how Miss Gwendolyn looked, how she stood. I even remember what she had on her feet and on her head, right? I remember she had this little head rag on. You know, we call it a gale, right? Or a head rag in the neighborhood, right? And uh, she had these little kids sneakers on with little white socks that rolled down, okay? Like little anklets. And there in that classroom, I heard her read probably her most well-known poem, a poem called We Real Cool. And when she read that poem, I thought, oh, oh, mercy. Oh, mercy. I want to do that. I want to write like her. I want to be like her. Little did I know at that time in my life that I actually could be her. I could actually be a poet, a published poet at that. In part two of this podcast, I'm going to share that poem with you, We Real Cool, the poem that opened my eyes to my new realization that I could be a published poet. Right now, I'm going to share part of another poem, and this poem is called Negro Hero. Miss Brooks wrote this poem during a time in our history when those two words, Negro Hero, especially those two words spoken side by side, absolutely arrested us. Those words spoken together stopped us dead in our tracks. Negro Hero. If she were still alive today, I I don't think Miss Brooks would be at all surprised that some of her words are still quite arresting. Now, before the poem begins, right after the title, Brooks writes that the poem is to suggest a person by the name of Dory Miller. Dory Miller. The Dory Miller she writes about here is an African-American war hero in World War II. Miller was a young kitchen attendant who went above and beyond his station and over and above the call of duty when the United States of America was attacked at Pearl Harbor. Mr. Miller was honored as a hero for his role in taking up arms against Japanese soldiers. Here is the opening verse, the very first stanza of Miss Brooks' poem, Negro Hero. I had to kick their law into their teeth in order to save them. However, I have heard that sometimes you have to deal devilishly with drowning men in order to swim them to shore, or they will haul themselves and you to the trash and the fish beneath. When I think of this, I do not worry about a few chipped teeth. I'm going to read that stanza again. Now remember, this is to suggest this African-American war hero from World War II, Dory Miller. Negro Hero I had to kick their law into their teeth in order to save them. However, I have heard that sometimes you have to deal devilishly with drowning men in order to swim them to shore. Or they will haul themselves and you to the trash and the fish beneath. When I think of this, I do not worry about a few chipped teeth.
So this poem demonstrates one of the hallmarks of Gwendolyn's poetry, and that's her ability to imaginatively write from the point of view of somebody else. Now, somehow she's able to sense into another person's life, imagining their thoughts, their feelings, their loves, their hatreds, their world. In poem after poem after poem, Brooks writes in her signature style. Another one of my favorite poems is called A Bronzeville Mother Loiters in Mississippi. Meanwhile, a Mississippi mother burns bacon. Yes, that's a title. (laughs) A Bronzeville mother loiters in Mississippi. Meanwhile, a Mississippi mother burns bacon. In this exquisite narrative poem, Brooks brings us into a landscape of the lives of two women who experience their own horrors after the brutal murder of Emmett Till. Brooks says, I couldn't have any rest until I wrote about that. I couldn't rest until I had done something, done my kind of something. Now, most folks who know about the history of the United States know about the tragic killing of Emmett Till, a 14-year-old black boy. What you may not know is that Miss Gwendolyn had a son, too. A son who, at that time, was also 14 years old. And the way she wrote about Emmett Till demonstrated her exceptional writing and poetic skills, as well as her many layers of emotional intelligence, as she portrays Carolyn Bryant's state of mind after her husband's acquittal for Emmett Till's murder. Murdered by Miss Bryant's husband for allegedly making a pass at her. Miss Brooks says, In writing poetry, you are interested in condensation. So you don't try to pull all of a particular impression or inspiration onto a single page. You distill. Poetry is life distilled. In her writing, Miss Brooks draws her impressions and inspirations from everyday life. Everyday life. As poet Elizabeth Alexander reminds us, it's hard. It's hard to think about Gwendolyn Brooks in the past tense, right? for she seemed to focus her writing in response to what is happening now. And so, she's been dead now for many years, but she still seems to be with us even now. Miss Gwendolyn, here with us now. And you know what? She shows up in many different ways. One of the most powerful ways she shows up is through the voices of other poets. Now, let's just think about this. We would not have a a Lucille Clifton or a Nikki Finney or a Rita Dove or a Tyumba Jess or Cornelius Eady or Toy Derricott or Elizabeth Alexander, Natasha Treathway, Hayes, Davis, Kyle Dargan, Tara Betts, Amanda Gorman, and I dare say dozens of other poets, African American and otherwise. We would not have these poets or their poetries without Gwendolyn Brooks. That's the power of one person. The one person who so impacts the lives of of many, many, many people. And the ripple effect is positively astounding. That's the power of poetry in motion. Years ago, when I was working with high school students, when they were in search of a poet with a strong sense of narrative and a strong sense of language, a 
wonderful, strong, powerful sense of imagery, of sight and sound and smell and touch, they would inevitably turn to the poetry of Gwendolyn Brooks. It was in these poems that they learned about about love, about tenderness, cruelty, compassion, hatred, perseverance, defeat, faithfulness, fear, vainglory, and victory. It was in Miss Gwendolyn's poems that my students learned about voice, the poet's voice, as well as their own voice. In another one of my podcasts, I pay a tribute to poet Dr. Maya Angelou. I share in that podcast that she could have been one of my elders in the community I grew up in, a community of folks I called my personal village. Well, you know what? The same is true about Gwendolyn Brooks. Being in that classroom with her all those years ago and then meeting her again at the Dodge Poetry Festival just a few short months before she died or reading her poems now is kind of like looking in a mirror. The words she uses in her poems, the words she used during our conversation, that rich, resonant sound of her voice, her sense of humor, <laughs> layered with paradox and irony. The way she hosted and treated people. I remember at the Dodge Festival, there must have been 150, maybe 200 people in line to have her sign books or to simply say thank you. Now, some folks were there for more than that. They wanted a conversation, <laughs> right? They wanted a few brief sentences with this queen of a woman. They wanted a small cup of what matters. Well, you know what? No matter how long the line or how long the wait, she treated you as if you were the only person in line the only person present among all those poetry-loving souls. I also remember from where I stood way back in the line that Miss Brooks seemed to be pulling out book after book from someplace near her chair. And I also remember seeing her slip a book into the hands of a number of people that she spoke with. Well, when it was my turn to have her sign my books, I noticed that the title of the book that she kept pulling out of the little box beside her chair was called Primer for Blacks. And yes, she slipped one of those books into my hand as well. Now, I don't recall if she grabbed my hand or if I grabbed hers, but I recall a moment when I had her hand in mine, a moment in time that remains fresh and vivid. In that tent, holding her hand, in that tent filled with people, I could actually imagine her as one of the many people in my community. The way she smiled like hot sunshine beaming down on red clay dirt. The angle of her head, the way her eyes just seemed to peer at you through her glasses, the way she sat that same little cloth on her head, the way she reached for a book, the way she made you feel like you were the only one in that big old tent, the only one who she was content to be with. In that moment, time stood still. Even now, as I recall that autumn evening in New Jersey, there I am at the front of the line, alone with Gwendolyn, alone in the midst of a crowd. Even now I can imagine myself in the same room with her, sitting right next to her at the same table, sharing stories, a cup of tea, and a few good poems, laughing and remembering good times, as our plates steam with sweet potatoes, 
collard greens, and cornbread. <laughs> the same kind of meal she shared with one of her adoring mentors, Langston Hughes, another amazing poet whose impact on Gwendolyn's life and my own life was profound. Even now. So, Gwendolyn, we lift you up and we celebrate you. We celebrate you during National Poetry Month and every single day. We celebrate you for making the invisible visible, for your compassionate artistry and your marvelous gifts of being awake to life and turning life the good, the gracious, the ugly, the tragic, into astonishing works of art. To you, we express our deep, deep gratitude. We thank you for showing us the power of poetry in motion and what the power of one person, of one person who lives their life to make a difference is all about. Now, that's exactly what we talked about earlier, right? And I promise to say more about how you can make your life count. So, here we go. You can make your life count by being there for someone who simply needs the sweet, precious fragrance of your presence. All right, so what does that mean? <laughs> well, maybe they just need you to listen. Maybe they just need you to listen to them talk about their day or how their mom is doing. Or maybe they need to talk about their relationship with their 13-year-old son or daughter. And they don't want to just talk with anybody. What they really need is you. Why? Because you listen. You listen with a smile in your heart. You listen without having to jump in and give advice. You listen because you really care. You can make your life count by the simple loving things you do for someone else. You could make your wife a cup of her favorite tea, not because she asked you to, but because you know it's her favorite and because you know her love language. Or maybe you put on her favorite music. Or maybe you go for a nice long walk with her, not because you need the exercise, <laughs> right? But you go just because, because you love her. You can make your life count by taking 15 or 20 minutes, 30 minutes to go through your closet this week, right? Maybe today. And you can pull out your gently used shirts or blouses, your gently used sweaters and slacks, and fold them and take them to your local Goodwill or thrift store. There's somebody out there who needs those gently used clothes. You can take whatever extra money you have to buy some food, right? A few extra cans of peas or beans or rice to donate to your local food bank. You can read a story to a child did you know that to a little girl or boy, attention is spelled L-O-V-E? <laughs> to make a difference, you don't have to do anything fancy or extraordinary. You don't have to wear a cape, you know, be a superheroine or a superhero. You just have to have a heart full of love. And you simply serve people without any expectation of return. You could pick a, a handful of fresh herbs from your deck or your garden and give them to a neighbor. Hey, you could bake a batch of cookies and take them to a nursing home. Okay? And be sure to give some to your mom when you visit her. Be sure to give some to the staff also. You could call a friend just because. And when you write a note to someone, be sure to include a, a few stamps or a bag of tea. My sister calls my mom every day just to say hello and to tell her how much she loves her. When I call my mom, I love to sing songs with her, the song she sang as a little girl. Now, sometimes she can't remember my name, but she remembers those songs. 
And sometimes I read to my mom because she loves stories. She loves to hear scripture. She loves to pray, right? So what's my point? Simply this, you can make a difference with what you already have. You can make a difference by showing up as who you are day by day, every day of your life. You make a difference by being grateful for who you are. Being grateful for family, for friends, for neighbors, for co-workers. By counting your blessings. And we can go beyond simply counting our blessings by being a blessing. Not too long ago, I was teaching a class. This was a class for leaders who want to take their faith into their work. Not as pastors or rabbis. These leaders want to take their faith into the nonprofit sector, into the education sector, right? Into the corporate sector, into the civic sector. Now, these people, these leaders work as police officers and firefighters, as agency directors in mental health, as leaders on our school boards. They are leaders in the military. They're educators who work with our youth. Now, all of these folks are all about making a difference. I say all of this because just like you and me, sometimes they get so focused on making a difference in someone else's life, guess what? They tend to forget about themselves. That's what happens when you're focused on serving, when you're focused on passing it on, when you're focused on giving back. So if you're like me, born to serve, (laughs) we must remember that one of the best ways to make a difference is to take good care of yourself first so that you can serve with a healthy body, mind, and soul. How we live is how we serve, right? How we live is how we serve or teach or parent or lead in any aspect of our lives. So let's remember to take good care of ourselves every single day, 365, 24-7. All right. Now, if you missed any part of this week's episode, you can listen to the recording at your convenience. You can even listen on the go. Check us out at www dot talknetworkradio.com that's www.talknetworkradio.com and remember to put this at the end of dot com forward slash hosts forward slash legacy living got it all right www.talknetworkradio.com forward slash hosts forward slash legacy living if you want to be the change you seek, be sure to listen to this podcast again and again and again. And be sure to tell somebody. You can find me on iTunes, Audible, Alexa, SoundCloud, iHeart, TuneIn, Spreaker.com, Talk Network Radio, and so many other places. You can learn more about my work and Legacy Living Make Your Life Count by visiting the Gloria Burgess website. That's G-L-O-R-I-A, Gloria Burgess, B-U-R-G-E-S-S dot com. Now, as I've mentioned before, if you love to be inspired, you can subscribe to my inspirations right on my website. You just scroll down a little bit, look on the right sidebar until you see the place to add your email address to subscribe to my weekly inspirations. It's that simple. Each week you get a lovely photograph and a very short quotation that inspires you. You can also find me on LinkedIn or Facebook. And on Facebook, you can find me at facebook.com forward slash dr, dr for doctor, dr Gloria Burgess, PhD forward slash. You can also hear and see me by visiting the TEDx site and listening to one of my TED Talks. All right? So just type in my name to find me there. 
Now, before I close today, I want to thank each of you once again for tuning in, for allowing me to share a bit about my journey with what legacy living is all about. Not just living and learning, but living and learning and serving so that you make a difference in your own life and in the lives of others. It's about being on purpose. Being on purpose every single day, 365, 24-7. Legacy living is a powerful way to make your life count. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria, Gloria Burgess, and this has been Legacy Living, Make Your Life Count. Please join me again next time for another episode of Legacy Living, Make Your Life Count. Now, don't just count the days in your life. Make the days in your life count. That's what legacy living is all about. Have a fantastic day. And remember, make the days in your life count. God bless. That's our show today. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria, Gloria Burgess. I hope you'll join me again next time. Until then, don't just count the days in your life. Make the days in your life count. That's what legacy living is all about. Here's to you. Have a fantastic day and be sure to make it a yes kind of day. Remember to celebrate the music of your life. Make the days in your life count.